morning, <clears throat> good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to the Inclusive Education Initiatives Research Exchange Workshop Series. My name is Dipti Samant Raja, and I'm a Social Development Specialist at the World Bank. I also work on the Inclusive Education Initiative, and this workshop is a part of IEI's broad portfolio of activities to promote disability inclusive education. Before we begin, I wanted to bring your attention to several accessibility features that we have available for you today. You should be able to see the sign language interpreter spotlighted on the screen with a speaker who is presenting. We also have captioning available in English. If you would like to access that, please go to the bottom of your screen. There is an icon that has CC for closed captioning, which you can click on and select show subtitles. You can also select show full transcript if you prefer to see that running on the right side of the screen. You can also follow the link we will provide in the chat box for streaming captions. We want to let you know that please to use the chat box to post your questions, comments, reflections, and information. Let's use it to make most of this workshop. We have colleagues moderating the chat and we will do our best to address your questions and your concerns. Finally, this seminar is being recorded live. All right. The IEI is a multi-donor trust fund on disability inclusive education, which is overseen by the World Bank with support from the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, NORAD, and the UK government's Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, or FCDO. The IEI invests in catalytic technical expertise and knowledge resources, which assist countries in making education progressively inclusive for children across a spectrum of disabilities. The IEI also supports development of global knowledge products, research, documenting evidence of practice, as well as innovations in disability inclusion. The research exchange workshop series is a very important activity for the IEI. It was conceived based on the growing evidence that the current status of research in the field of disability inclusive education is at best patchy, with insufficient evidence on school access, participation, learning outcomes, and effectiveness of implementation programs, particularly in low and middle income countries. In parallel, there is an increasing acknowledgement that researchers based in African and South Asian countries have limited pathways and opportunities to undertake and publish their research. This significantly impedes their ability to contribute meaningfully to the, dis to the disability inclusive education agenda, resulting in significant over-reliance on discourses and contexts from high income countries that are then used to shape international and national policy formulation. Therefore, this workshop series, through this workshop series rather, we aim to identify the research priorities in the field of disability inclusive education, as well as to understand the challenges and the barriers faced by scholars in African and South Asian countries while researching and publishing. We want to promote collaborations amongst universities in the Sub-Saharan African and South Asian regions while supporting to increase the visibility of scholarship from low and middle income countries. We hope that this workshop series leads to the cultivation of a cohort of researchers that support disability inclusive education with the IEI and beyond. Today, we kickstart the first of our series of four workshops. Uh, thanks to all of you joining us from the East and Southern Africa region. We have amongst us 35 researchers from universities across the region representing 10 countries and 26 universities. Collectively, this group is truly diverse with 37 spoken languages, including four sign languages and a wide range of experience in conducting research in disability inclusive education. It would be great to know all of the participants. However, in the interest of time, we kindly request you to please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat box rather than um, an oral round of introductions. I have to first, I have to start by also saying that this workshop would not be possible without the collaboration of our knowledge partners, the University of Cambridge and the University of Gondor. We are grateful for their commitment and support. We are also joined by members of the Candor Research Group from University of Cambridge who are supporting the workshop as co-facilitators. 
And we also have Jorge Martin, who is illustrating the workshop live. A big thanks to you all. We couldn't do it without you. We know that this workshop series is taking place under unusual circumstances. And hence, I want to especially thank you all for bringing your extensive experience and knowledge to this space and for engaging in our LinkedIn forum. We will bring in the perspectives and comments from the forum into this session. We have an excellent interactive and participatory agenda planned for the next two hours. I'm looking forward to learning from everyone. Without further ado, I would like to now invite Professor Tiruso Tefera. Dr. Tiruso is a professor and laureate in special needs education at Addis Ababa University. His research and publications are on early intervention, care and learning, focusing on children with special needs. He has worked extensively on international collaborative research projects and is currently the overall project leader of the Ethiopian Education Roadmap Development Team. Dr. Tiruso, I hand over to you now. Thank you very much. I would first of all like to welcome all participants. It is indeed an honor and a pleasure to be part of the Inclusive Education Initiative work Workshop Series. Please permit me to seize this opportunity to extend my gratitude to the World Bank and the funders, FSDO and NORAD for providing such a platform. I am here to share my experience on the policy and practice of inclusive education in Ethiopia vis-a-vis -vis sub saharan African countries. Uh, policy directions of education for persons with disabilities in sub saharan Africa. Following UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, the standard rules on the equalization of opportunities for persons with disabilities and the Salamanca framework for action, which paves the way towards inclusive education, almost all Eastern and Southern African countries came up with policies of inclusion. The government of Ethiopia in 2006 issued the first national policy indicating that the future direction of education for persons with disabilities in the country is inclusive. After six years of experience, in 2012, it was the policy was revised and the present special needs education policy was in place. The overall objective of the new strategic framework was to build an inclusive education system, which is accessible, equitable to children, youth, and adults with disability in the country. Dear participants, it was hoped that such a policy will enable persons with disabilities to develop their potential and come up out of the long-standing dependency syndrome and lead an independent life. Indeed, in the Ethiopian context, among others, considering its economic viability, human rights issue, the psychosocial developmental benefits, as well as the positive, the positive effects on the bridging attitudinal gaps where the main rationals to move towards inclusive education in the country. These reasons were, were more or less similar for other Sub-Saharan African countries to move forward towards inclusion. Dear participants, along this line, with the already existing special schools, inclusive schools have emerged in the different corners of the country. Even though the policy documents show the political will to move towards inclusive education, experience suggests that access and equity still remain a serious challenge across the different levels of the educational system in the country. The current annual statistics report of the Ministry of Education reveals that participation rate at pre-primary is 0.9, primary 11.1, and secondary 2.8, which seems up to be 15% of the children with disability to have access to education. That means 85% are still out of school. This statistics covers those surveyed in the emerging inclusive schools, the new reverse inclusive schools and the already existing special schools. Dear participants, those who are, 
who are enrolled in the inclusive schools do not as such gain the necessary professional attention and assistance in the so-called inclusive settings. Among others, the programs, including the curriculum, teaching learning process, assessment method, are found to be Professor Teresol, we seem to have lost you. Are you still able to hear us? Maybe let's give a minute to see if Dr. Teresol can reconnect. I see his screen, but you're muted. You need to unmute yourself. He's, he's back. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Can Please you hear go me? ahead. Yes, yes, we can uh, hear okay. you. Yeah, sorry. Finally, dear participants, I would like to highlight opportunities, challenges, and future areas of research and intervention to enhance quality of inclusive education in Sub Saharan Africa. Opportunities, challenges, research, and intervention areas. Opportunities, actually. Uh, national policies are very positive, encouraging, and international conventions are taken as opportunities. Uh, challenges, attitudinal problem, public, the attitude of the public, the general public, as well as the attitude of the schools, the school leaders, teachers, managers matters a lot absence of trained personnel in the field of inclusive education or special needs education, lack of screening and assessment tools at the entry point or placement, absence of coordination <coughs> and teamwork, <coughs> sorry, lack of resource and funding, inadequate funding. Uh, these are the major challenges. The research and intervention areas, which uh, I have uh, six, yeah, major areas here. The first one is professional development, which include teacher education program, both pre-service and in-service. We need to revisit our teacher education program, how far they include the uh, education of inclusive education. Teachers, would be teachers need to be prepared to work an inclusive setting and therefore teacher education programs need to do well on inclusion, theoretically, as well as practically. And the, those who are teaching, active in teaching, they need to, to get in-service teacher training program. At least everybody should be able to map out the situation of the school teachers in their respective schools. Uh, the other point on professional development, especially in inclusive education experts, we need such experts. Actually, we need such experts to facilitate, to coordinate the inclusive education program, to support, backup support to general educators. They should be assigned uh, uh, at schools so that they give backup support for general educators and also pull out program for children who are in need of special support. The other major area is developing operational manual for inclusive education. Uh, I think this is very important. Uh, policy is not enough because we see policies simply floating uh, around, but we need to have operational manual for school principals. When they say their school is inclusive, they need to know what, what major areas need to be addressed. Teachers need to have that manual and parents, caregivers need to be also uh, 
given such manuals. The other the third Professor point. Professor very, very sorry to interrupt you. Um, if I may request you to uh, uh, wrap up your remarks in maybe another yeah. two minutes. Thank you. So I much. have three points. I have three points only. School based intervention. This school based intervention needs inclusive school policy. The school should have a policy on inclusive, inc inclusive education or culture. And there should be, this is a, a new initiative in Ethiopia, inclusive resource center uh, centers. We need to establish inclusive education resource centers, which provide backup support both for children with disability and class teachers. And there we can do assessment conduct school-based research, experience sharing amongst schools, enabling school, creating and enabling school environment. The other one is school, parent, and community engagement. This is very critical. Without it, we cannot promote uh, quality inclusive education, training, and, and exchange of experience, awareness raising, resource mobilization. The fifth one, coordination and collaboration among relevant government and non-governmental actors. And national associations of persons with disabilities. This is very critical. Without their involvement, I think uh, we are going to face a lot of difficulties. The last one is the, the exercise that we are doing now, international and regional networking. This is very crit critical to learn from one another uh, and collaborate in research. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Teresa. And Thank you for setting the stage for us this morning. We really appreciate your remarks. I would, now, you. I would now like to call upon Professor Nidhi Singhal, who is a professor of disability and inclusive education at the University of Cambridge. Nidhi has worked extensively with children and young people with disabilities in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Her research has examined the educational experiences of children with disabilities, the quality of teaching and learning in mainstream classrooms and the impact of schooling. Nedhi, I invite you to please share the findings from your, research, from your recent report on primary schooling for children with disabilities, a review of African scholarship. The floor is yours, Nedhi. Thank you so much, Dipti, and a huge thanks to Professor Terusu also. I am going to start by sharing my screen and just welcoming everybody on my behalf too. What a pleasure to see so many familiar names um, and I'm really looking forward to the discussions. So I have around 10 minutes for this presentation and I'll try and wrap up a little quickly. I'm going to time myself so I'm not over time. But um, as Deepthi has very kindly um, said, this is a review of African scholarship. I do realize that the report was posted very kindly by Anna on the LinkedIn website for the um, the workshop itself. So some of you might be familiar with some of the findings. I'm going to offer this as provocations to the discussions later on that I know we'll be having in various breakouts. So just some headline figures that I'd like to go through. So the whole report draws on something called the African Education Research Database. Now the AERD is a catalog of social science research that brings together articles published in internationally recognized journals. It focuses not just on education-based journals, but also draws on education-related studies in other fields such as health, development, and so on. So it's a really comprehensive database to really see what kind of scholarship is emerging in the sub-Saharan African context, because what it does, it includes all the journal articles which have been published by at least one researcher based in the region. So it's a very comprehensive database, though I must put a caveat here, it does not include research emerging from South Africa, okay, but it covers other 48 countries in the region. So what we did my team, that's uh, Rafael Mitchell and Carrie Spencer, we looked at this particular database to try and find out journal articles which were cataloged specifically with the word disability. So we wanted to understand what kind of research is being published in the field in relation to children with disabilities. A caveat again here, these are all to do with English language articles. We did not review for French, Portuguese, 
um, based articles which are in the database. We only focused on English language due to our own limitations with language. And the analysis took place last year in January. So a few other studies would have been added, but they're not part of this review. So when we looked at the AERD and we looked at what how disability is being cataloged within this database, we were asking various questions. So one of the first questions was to look at the research to see what patterns exist in publications on disability and education by researchers based in Sub-Saharan Africa. What are the salient findings emerging from this body of research? What is it that we're understanding as a result of the research being conducted here? And indeed, what are the implications for current policy, practice, and research? So the big report really goes into depth in relation to all these three questions. I'll be focusing on just some key headlines here. So of the 1,650 articles in the database, 87 we found were cataloged with the keyword disability. So that's around 5% of the database did have the word disability cataloged in there. So we've tried to focus on what areas of education level, what these studies focusing on. To some extent, not surprisingly, a huge proportion of the database, of the studies in this database, which were cataloged with disability, were focused on primary education. So nearly 45% of the studies were at the looking at the primary education level. Again, not surprising, because that's where the free primary education mandate is. What was a little surprising here is that the number of studies looking at early childhood education was way smaller, but that's a story for another time. In this review, the 39 studies, which were part of the primary education, which were focusing on primary education, were our unit of analysis. So we wanted to really understand what are these studies saying? What are the themes emerging from here? And the first thing that comes to mind when we're looking at the trends and patterns is that the research within the region is very much concentrated on a few nations, within a few nation states we're talking about. Seven countries, and that's what the graph on the left-hand side of my slide shows, there was just one paper over the last few years which was focusing on disability inclusive education. Even though Nigeria is the most prophylic country in the larger database, means most of the studies in the larger database seem to be coming from scholars based in Nigeria. This was not the case for disability-based focus studies. What is really also interesting to some extent here is that there were only 14 of the 39 studies which were written e either solely by Sub-Saharan African-based authors, okay, or in collaborations with others. And of these, very little collaboration was within the region. So we did not see much collaboration within scholars based across different countries within the Sub-Saharan region. 80% of the collaborations which were taking place were affiliated to just four countries globally, Australia, Canada, UK, and USA. So of the 39 studies, 25 were international collaborations, but only restricted to four countries around the world, which again says some really interesting points around funding patterns, etc. The type of research which was focused here was very much policy reviews. So we thematically analyzed where these studies were focusing on. Policy reviews was one aspect. Testing the efficacy of specific interventions, not surprisingly, quite a few of the health journals were having studies on education focus studies in relation to specific interventions, in relation to children who were identified as deaf, hearing impairment, etc. And then implementation of inclusive education as a typology emerged in the majority of the studies. What is interesting again in my graph on the left hand side, and I really don't need you to dwell too much on it, what the point that being made here is that there was a concentration on only a few disability types, and there was much greater focus on sensory impairments 
and learning disabilities, however these were defined in the country context. Again, what is interesting is that there was a huge dominance of qualitative studies rather than mixed methods. There were large scale quantitative studies and the samples here extended up to around 3000 um, children um, to around 11,000 households. These were big studies which were looking at patterns of engagement. In the more qualitative studies, there was a tendency to really focus more on attitudes, beliefs, and experiences. There was a huge domination in the research studies on focusing on things like attitudes and beliefs. Even though we have a category called teachers and teaching within the database, uh, within our analysis, the focus of studies which were looking at teaching practices were not necessarily through looking at deep observations in the classroom, rather they were perceptions gathered from the teachers. So what was missing was sometimes really what was happening in the classroom rather than how teachers think they were doing something in the classroom. So huge domination of qualitative studies, but more focused on interviews and a huge domination of questionnaires, attitudes and beliefs. So that was where the trends were emerging in the studies. Not surprisingly, to some extent, we looked at recurring themes, how the studies were saying what needs to be done differently, and there are four things that emerged. Most of the studies noted the need to work really highlight, highlighted what Professor Terrazu to some extent talked about, the confusion and lack of clarity around inclusive education, which is further complicated by disconnected policy ambitions, and practical realities of implementation. It is really interesting that especially the studies which were talking about implementation continue to highlight the need to develop more contextualized understandings around inclusive education. There was also a great acknowledgement in some of the studies for the need to work across all the levels of the system and not merely at the school level. So there was a lot of discussion in some of the studies where scholars were arguing to look at the overall programs and policy frameworks. What is really interesting for us was the significant exclusion of voices of children with disabilities. Only five studies actually had some quotes from children with disabilities themselves in terms of their experiences. Otherwise, the default position tended to be to rely on parents and teachers to understand how they thought children were doing in the classroom. And finally, all the studies to some extent were making a case for the need to identify and adopt local strategies in moving forward in inclusive education. There were a few studies which took on a very strong need for post-colonial approaches, but they were not very explicit in what it meant in relation to the practice. So just some questions we pose in the report, and this is my final slide, is a greater reflection on whose voice counts Given the domination of international collaborations, we wondered who is driving the research agenda, not just in terms of posing the questions, but in terms of the use of certain methods and prioritizing of certain stakeholder groups. Where and how do partnerships manifest? We were rather surprised by the lack of southern south, -South collaborations within the sub Saharan African region. And indeed, finally, what are the theoretical and eth ethical underpinnings of current scholarship? There was not much of a discussion around the theoretical underpinnings, which in many cases was borrowed again from the Northern scholarship, rather than a deeper engagement with what it meant for the African region as a whole. And indeed, a deeper engagement with ethical issues around knowledge generation and knowledge dissemination. So I'm gonna stop here. Back to you, Great. Great. Thank you so much, Nidhi. Um, hello, everyone. And my name is Ruchi Singh, and I work at the Disability Inclusion Team at the World Bank. And I will be moderating today's workshop from here onwards. And let me just start by saying a, a big thanks to DC for 
professor to you. So, and of course, Nidhi, who's just given us this amazing presentation on this report. Um, I personally find it, that um, the report to be extremely interesting and especially the patterns of publication on disability and education and the discussion around the contextual interpretation and understanding of inclusive education, which is critical as we move forward and think about some of the ways in which we and the issues in which we more deeply, you know, begin to articulate the research priorities and uh, within the area of disability inclusive education. So I do want to say that if there are questions related to the report, please go ahead and type them in the chat box. We will address them in detail and we'll take them to our LinkedIn forum so that we keep this conversation going. So please do um, you know, type in your questions, your comments, and your reflections. With that said, and I'm being very mindful of the time that we have with you all today, I want to, I think it's a good moment to segue into the next session for the workshop, which is a breakout session. Uh, we will be dividing everybody who's present with us today into, uh, into five breakout rooms where we will have the opportunity to discuss in detail some of the emerging themes which have started coming out from the report. But just to pick up on those threads and then discuss those in detail. Um, nobody, you don't have to do anything from your end. You will be automatically transferred into a breakout group. Um, and for this particular breakout session, we will be reflecting upon two questions. Um, the first one is, what challenges are faced by African scholarship in conducting robust research around disability inclusive education? That's our first question, which we will be discussing, followed by the second one, which is, what should be the research priorities in disability inclusive education? So in order to do this, each group will have a session facilitator and a co-facilitator. Um, your facilitators and co-facilitators will guide the discussion. Um, just as a reminder, please do remember to choose one group representative who will present the summary of the discussion from your group to the larger group. We have around 25 minutes to discuss this. And um, I now leave uh, it up to Anastasia to divide us all into the five groups. And just one note to the facilitators, please remember to record your respective sessions by pressing the record button. So Anastasia, over to you, I'll let you do your magic. So we have people in the breakout rooms joining room two is full. Room three is fine too. Room four is fine. Room five is fine. And the rest uh, who are in assistance are here with us with the inter international sign language and the captioner. Hi, Anastasia, you need to push me also into a group. I'm supposed to be facilitating one. Sure. Um, Niji, group one is the bigger group because here we have international sign language interpreter and the oh. commissioner. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. So is this the group I'm supposed to be facilitating? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Oh, well, hello, everybody. I am very sorry. I didn't realize that this is where I am. Can I just check if uh, Natura is here? Hello, let's see. Yes, Nicholas. Yeah, I'm, I'm, here, I'm, I'm here, like in, in the Nidhi group, and everybody's here, I think. 
Yes, it, in, in, you know what? Um, no, I can yes, hear Nidhi. Excellent. Thank you, Mikas. Uh, I, I think I'm facilitating this group, right? So should we get started? I should be facilitating another group, I think. Yes, okay, you're going to group you four. Mm -hmm. Okay, I am going to get us started. This is group one. And um, thank you ever so much, everyone. It's really good to see um, everyone here. If you are still here, then means you're going to be part of this group one. I just want to check again, is Thilanka here? Because Thilanka will be yes. doing note taking for us. Yes, Nidhi, I'm here. Excellent. Hi, Thilanka. Well, um, can I also request, because this is something Ruchi said earlier on, there would be someone from the group who'd be required to give feedback to the larger session, um, to the larger group when we all come back from our breakout groups. Is there a volunteer here? Okay, Emma, thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Really appreciate that. And Anastasia, I can see Stephanie is also here. I think she needs to go into another group for note-taking purposes. Yes. Okay. Stephanie, do so, you know which group are you supposed to be? Yes, group two, please. Share one second. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you. Okay, so the ones who are here are part of group one. My name's Nidhi, and I'll be facilitating the two questions which have been posed. Um, could I please uh, request you to, um, you know, you can introduce yourself within the larger chat if you write your name, et cetera, that'll be fantastic. I'm going to spend 10 minutes on one question and then move on to another, to the second question. So the first question that we've been posed is what challenges are faced by the African scholarship in conducting robust research? So I would welcome reflections from the participants in the group if you'd like to highlight any challenges that you face, you're aware of, et cetera. Emma, please go ahead. Oh, thank you. Um, I just think um, often we overlooked and just because we seen as part of the global South, um, yeah, often we missed for opportunities for funding and um, there's, sometimes there's a reluctance for global North partnerships. I know that it's, it's now becoming trendy, but for so long it's been us versus them. And um, you know, I, just, I personally feel we've had to jump through a lot more hoops to be seen as on par with, with what's happening overseas. Well, sorry, overseas is a bit um, too broad, but um, yeah, from, from the global, global South, global North, um, yeah, just an undermining of we, we not, we can't be taken that seriously. Um, yeah, and, and, and I know it's because of our history and I know it's from where we come, but um, yeah, I, I just feel we've got extra hoops to prove that we are on par with everybody else. That's really interesting, Emma. So yeah, so you, when you say at par, do you want to elaborate on it? Is it, you feel that funding bodies don't take the research emerging from Southern context more seriously or researchers there as being rigorous? What is it? What do you mean by at par? Yeah, and, and I mean, I know some of us did not get great education, and but to me, it's just, we've got such important stories to tell that are not being shared. And some of the contexts that I read about in international inclusive education journals are not applicable to the majority. I mean, if you think about the majority of countries are not sitting in with the resources in the global global North. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, not taken seriously in terms of academic qualifications or that our research is, as rigorous as it would be um, in, uh, in other countries. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just my personal experience. I could be horribly wrong and I'd love input from other people too. Sorry, I'm taking the floor. No, Emma, that's really um, useful. Would anyone else like to come in? Hello. So, uh, yeah, go ahead, please go ahead. It's best to just unmute yourself and um, go ahead and say something. I can see. Uh, someone did unmute themselves, and then I have Jority. I'm sorry if I'm making a hash out of your names, but would you like to come in? Uh, 
Hello, is, is that is that me? Yes, please do go ahead. Yes, thank, thank you so much. Uh, I think I would agree with what Emma was saying, but give it a slightly uh, different slant where I would say perhaps the, the research gaps uh, from the global north tend to be different from those from the global south. So it's a bit more difficult for someone from the global south to publish in a, in a world journal, it's world in courts, because it's basically global north focus. So if, if you are not following the, the, the gaps from the global north and you're coming from the south, it will be much more difficult for you to, 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 to write that which will interest the editors and the reviewers who will basically be largely from the global north. Thank you. That's what I would add as a slant. Thank you, Martin. I think that's a really interesting point again. So you talked about, so Emma was talking about academic qualifications and rigorous, and you're talking about how publishing itself is, you know, very much construed towards global northern understandings. I can see two more hands. So let's see. Um. Yeah, this is Gorechi. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is Gorechi from Uganda. Um, my network, I'm sorry, my network is quite low, so I'm not going to put on the video. But uh, anyway, um, uh, the, the challenge that have, I have really seen with the re research is that there is a tendency to have research, which is a one-off. We, we, we don't have tracer studies. We, we need to have studies that Yes, you have done a study uh, about uh, children with disabilities or persons with disabilities, inclusive education, and then what happens in the next five years. So we need to have studies, pressure studies that will keep on following up what is happening, not to not to do research for just as a one-off and then we just go on like that. So we don't have a lot of studies doing follow-up pressure studies, long-term uh, long studies. Thank you yeah, very much. Thank you, Gorati. That's such a good point about longitudinal studies and following children. Uh, we tend to do one-off studies and especially so important when you're thinking about issues around inclusive education. So thank you so much for that. I've seen a few more hands okay. up. Um, uh, Titsi? Hello. Hello. Yeah. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you very much. Um, I agree with the previous speakers with regards to research from the global south. But my feeling is, I think for a long time, the, the level field for research between the global south and the global north has never been well, the playing field has never been leveled. Uh, I think I've posted in what was one of my questions there to say, even if research is being conducted in the global south, the global south researchers, they seem to play a second fiddle in the sense that the way funders, especially from the global south structure, um, the issue of PIs, it's always somebody from the global north. And my question is, are they not looking at uh, researchers from the global south as potential PIs? What, what message are we sending? Because the research is being conducted in global north. And the, for me, the best person to actually lead that would be someone coming from that region because we understand the context, we understand everything that happens within that setup. So for me, that alone, it shows that the, there's no leveled playing field. And I think we also know that in, this, in the global South, there are a lot of economic issues. So issue, issues of research funding becomes an issue uh, at, at local level. And hence, most of research funding, you find that you, it's, it's more from the global north, which unfortunately, again, at some times, they kind of set the agenda, making it very difficult for, for the global researchers. 
global north south researchers unless you really a like a go getter and a vigorous researcher who knows your your standpoint that's when you can even influence the development of the research proposal so that it's balanced in terms of what it really wants to set thank you that, that's such a great point about research funding and who becomes the pi and where's the funding coming from so i'm going to bring a uh, jennifer in jennifer you've got a hand up um yeah thank you very much um i would like to concur with uh, my colleague but uh, i have a different um kind of observation for me i'd say what the major problem that we have sometimes it's a lack of drive uh for us who are in the global south ourselves to initiate local research in our countries we are the ones who are on the ground of the challenges which are being faced in our communities, in our schools, in our country in general, in terms of promoting education of children with disabilities. But uh, most of the times we don't take the initiative to start the research ourselves. We wait for the colleagues from the global north to sometimes write proposals, seek for funding, and then they uh contact um, to partner with them now how can we exceed pis when we are not taking these proposals to win the funding to really work on in coming up with proposals writing for funding i know there are some conditions which are tough for us who are in the global south to get funding but still more we need to continue um fighting this uh, another problem when we have, have this uh research the roles and responsibilities uh within a partnership between the north and the south it's always a problem us in the south, we end up um, getting roles, which are, I don't know how to put it, but we are the ones who run on the ground. We go in the field, we correct the data, we do all the, the groundwork, um, and we submit the findings to our colleagues in the global north, who at the end of the day, they write the papers, and sometimes even publish without acknowledging the role of a, 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 this person who was running on the ground. So we really have uh, serious problems which we need to consider if our research is to be um, acknowledged and published uh, the way it's supposed to be. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I, I think you've raised a really important point of unequal partnerships. Um, and also your first point about we don't take the initiative within the Global South, I think that'll be a really interesting one to come to in the second session when we're going to be talking about opportunities. So thank you so much for flagging that, Jennifer. Can I invite Solomon in, please? Yeah, thank you, Nedek. Is this group three, is group five? This is group one. <laughs> because I am a facilitator in group five that I cannot able to connect, oh, yeah. you know, maybe the co-facilitator will. I don't know what's going on. Anyway, I am using my mobile because the laptop connection is unstable. Just, I don't know what's going on anyways. Let me speak in, uh, it just, you know, from my end, uh, it's a matter of attention, actually. Uh, scholars uh, in, in Africa, especially in East Africa, they give due attention, more focus on those research areas, which have, you know, uh, a public health priority. I know that this is also a public health priority, but the challenge is, you know, it's from the government should give due attention as a public health priority and invest, you know, research grant or create a co-partner or collaborator out, outside, you know, the country who can uh, support the area of inclusive. This is one of the basic challenges. And uh, this is one of the neglected, ne neglected area, I can say that, uh, so that bring you know, uh, you know, uh, people's not to to towards you know conducting research, and uh, the other challenge is you know, 
the funder. The funder is not interested. You know, I know that you know the focus in Africa is you know one one is health, like you know infectious diseases, and the the other the other focus is you know uh, poverty, nutrition, and the like. The, uh, in terms of education, uh, we are at an infant stage, especially in addressing inclusive education with ch for children with disability. So the, uh, for me, I feel that uh, there is no priority in the government. There is no priority uh, grant support, and there is a lack of understanding the relevance of this study also from the research side. So this makes, you know, you know, uh, lack of focus, uh, or you can even you cannot find you know any publication in area in Ethiopia where I am living. So just to reflect, thank you. Thank you, Solomon. I think that's a really interesting point about research priorities. I'm going to bring in uh, Sepsil. Uh, thank you so much um, for this opportunity. I also agree with all the colleagues, um, but I'll just add one or two uh, reasons that I think apply to some of the countries in the Global South. One of them is, um, you know, countries are not the same. Some of the countries don't prioritize research uh, to inform planning and also you know, implementation. So when research is not prioritized, even if as an individual working in government, um, you have that individual drive, but you find that, um, you know, there is no funding, no forums where you can share the research findings. So that becomes a, a bit of a challenge, um, you know, to conduct um, research. And I think the other thing that I've observed is the issue of lack of mentoring. Personally, I have been able to publish uh, one paper, you know, having partnership with someone from the North and then three papers on my own because um, th this person who is experienced in research has been mentoring us. And also maybe the other reason is exposure and being aware of opportunities to do research out there if it's not present locally at international level. So the mentor sort of, uh, you know, shares the information and you are able to take it if you have the time, you know, the, the resources um, uh, to do it. So basically for me, those are, you know, um, the reasons why, um, just to answer, we have challenges um, as African scholars. Thank you. Thank you so much, Absol, for sharing that. I think the issue around lack of mentoring is such an interesting one, in addition to the other points which have been raised, but I think that's a really interesting one. So thank you so much for sharing that. Can I invite Joseph in, please? Thank you very much uh, for all the contributions that have been made so far. I, I would like to take note of um, issues in relation to national levels in the global south. I realized that, um, you know, while disability issues is now actually commonly referred to uh, internationally, you will find that in the global south, it largely remains theoretical, just on paper. You know, sometimes you realize that even emphasizing research at that level, you know, at national level, you know, it, there's no emphasis. Yes, there's a lot of talk. It actually remains a talk shop. Uh, I, I think that's my observation. And it actually you know, discourages for us to focus on that. And let alone the issue of funding there is so difficult for it to be forthcoming. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joseph. Um, that's really interesting. Again, uh, you're raising, resonating some of the things which others are saying about the lack of apathy or the rather apathy um, in the system to some extent. I, Emma, can I invite you in before we move on to the next question? So final reflections on the first question itself. Thank you, just, just another quick thing. For, for me also, it's some of us don't have the same idea of what inclusive education actually means. So when we submit to international journals, they go, no, but actually that's not inclusive education. You're talking about segregation, but using the word inclusive education. 
So sometimes I just think it's a standardization of language um, that we actually just need to understand that we're all talking about the same thing, because that's going to throw us straight out of a journal um, if we're not using the, the, the terms correctly. Sorry, do you want me to sum up everything or did you just want me to add that point? Sorry. No, just add that point for the time being. I will be asking you to sum up for the group. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I think you raised a really interesting point and I do worry about that because there doesn't need to be a hegemony of how we understand inclusive education. And some of the journals do take that as a starting point that everyone should understand it in the same way, whereas it does not. You know, it has to lend itself to, to context. And I think that's what one of the things we found in the review, many of the African scholars were saying about how we need to have different interpretations of inclusion. You know, the principles remain the same, but how we operationalize it could be different. So now thank you for, for that, Emma. Can I move us in? I realize we're running short on time, but those were such really interesting points. Can I move us to the next question? We have around five minutes for that. The next question that we've been posed by the team to discuss is, what should be the research priorities in disability inclusive education? So I guess you all of you have such huge experience in the field. So what are the things that you think are really needed um, one of the things that Gorethi has already pointed out is the need for longitudinal studies, which I totally, totally think is so important. But what are the research priorities? Can I invite you to please um, share your thoughts on that? Gorethi, is your hand up for the new question or is it left over hand? No, no, that's a left over hand. That's, okay. hand. Mm. That's fine. Joseph, would you want to say something about research priorities? I can see your hand up. Maybe. I, I have, sorry, I've already made my contribution. Okay, okay. Um, Calista, I think your hand went up now. They yes. feel left overhand, so I'm getting confused. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Uh, for me, I think, um, you know, in our, our global south context, the role of the family and the community is very critical because you find that for most children, as much as maybe the policy framework is um, being improved and the schools are trying uh, to make an effort, if the home front does not understand the need for that child to be included in school, really be um, doing what other kids of that age are doing, it can be very problematic. So inclusion of the family and the community will help so that they, they, there is uh, communication between the school and the home. And actually it can be an approach of rather using a, an inclusive education ecosystem rather than just uh, a school and the authorities working towards inclusiveness. So yeah, I, that, that is my point. Thanks. Now that's a really good point. So broadening the lens from the individual to looking at um, family and community. I'm gonna bring in someone who's not said anything. Martin, would you like to um, um, provide your reflections? Yes, th thank you so much for this chance to talk on research priorities uh, on inclusive education for children with disabilities. I think what I would prioritize is what uh, you have just made reference to, the generation of principles for inclusive education. We know that um, the different contexts will determine what is inclusive and what is not. We cannot have uh, one global way of thinking about inclusive education. How we interpret uh, things to be inclusive will be different depending on where we are. But I think we need to be able to generate basic principles about what is inclusive education. I have here in mind the example of uh, segregation versus uh, inclusive education where it is generally considered that if you are in a separate school for children with special needs, automatically you are segregated. And I'm saying this need not be true. If you look at the example of uh, children who are deaf and need sign language, we, we are saying in a special school for the deaf where they have a critical mass 
and they have specialist teachers who can sign, they can be included. So we want to draw from that a principle that defines inclusive education rather than looking at places. Are they in a mainstream school or in a special school? So we, we need to prioritize research that draws such principles so that they are uh, more understood. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Martin. I think that's a really good place to stop. And I can see other people are coming back to the main uh, room. So the group one, the ones who've not had a chance to say any, um, wanted to reflect and have not had a chance to share their thoughts with the bigger group, could I just ask you to put it in the chat, please? And thank you so much for the discussions. I'm going to stop here. And I think Richie's going to step in. Thank you, Nidhi. Thank you so much uh, for that. And I think, I hope everybody is back um, uh, into the main room, if I'm not mistaken. I see it, all participants back. Um, so I hope you all had um, a good discussion in your respective groups. Um, and um, there were some interesting conversations, certainly in the group that I was there, there were some really interesting insights and conversations. So I think with, uh, with, with just moving forward, I think it would be great now if we can share some of the key discussion points which came out from the breakout groups with everyone. Um, I hope everyone, every group was able to appoint a session representative. And I will just call upon um, the session representatives now uh, one by one to sh share the key points from your discussions um, uh, with the larger group. And you will have around two minutes uh, to do that. Very short, very crisp. Um, so, um, so please, uh, please kind of, you know, come forward. You can put your video on and so that everybody can see you. You can introduce yourself and the rest of the members in the group. Uh, and just share in two minutes what your um, key points from the group were. And for all the other participants, I will uh, request you to share their comments, reflections, and questions in the chat box as usual. So uh, let's get this kick started. Can we please have the representative from group number one, please? Sure. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm gonna sum up. Um, so we spoke about some of the challenges between Global North and Global South partnerships and some of the inequalities in terms of how we might be viewed as inferior and our research not as credible as Global North, for example. Um, also looking at longitudinal studies. We don't have as many, but I'm gonna talk about that when we get to our priority areas as well. Um, and um, also just looking at economic issues. Many of us don't have the funding, our institutions don't have the funding. Um, so we have to rely on partnerships with Global North. But then sometimes some of our colleagues will say that then sometimes the ownership, so we go do the field work, we do the interviews and everything. And then the, the data gets handed over. And then sometimes we're not acknowledged for uh, as being involved. And yeah, and, and that can be quite challenging. Um, also, um, yeah, just, uh, just uh, speaking to unequal partnerships there, uh, research priority areas as well. Um, sometimes it's more focused on health than inclusive education. Um, different countries have got different priority areas. Um, and also some of us don't have um, a support base, uh, mentors 